Hello guys, so we're on to part 5 today and this is one that I've been both looking forward to and absolutely dreading uh, for the past few weeks. Looking forward to because I think it's an extremely interesting topic and I think it's a topic that probably isn't spoken about enough um, but dreading because it is very very complicated and I've been struggling to you know find the right words uh, of how I'm going to really explain it but I'm going to do my best and hopefully it makes sense. Let's get to it. Now already you might be a little bit confused because uh, in this series I said we'd be focusing on, on PCPs but we're talking about recoil here and PCPs and recoil aren't supposed to go together um, and I suppose if you look at a centerfire or a rimfire or a springer and you compare it to a PCP there is hardly any recoil on a PCP but it is there if you look hard enough and it can seriously affect your accuracy so we are going to actually take the time to talk about it today. So let's start off by looking at a gun, just any old PCP, what actually happens when you take a shot? Well most people's response is to say that the muzzle blast is what causes the recoil. And yes, muzzle blast does cause some recoil, but only after the pellet has left the barrel. So what we really need to ask is what's going on within the rifle between the time the trigger is pulled and the time the pellet exits the muzzle. This is where it gets interesting. Now when that hammer hits the valve and air is released in a sort of mini explosion within the rifle, vibrations resonate throughout the rifle in the form of standing waves. These waves, or oscillations if you want to call them that, have what are called nodes and anti-nodes. The nodes are basically the points at which there's no movement and the anti-nodes are the points at which movement is the most severe. But there's one important factor we need to consider when talking about vibrations in PCP air guns and that's the hammer weight and hammer strike force. When the hammer strikes the valve, regardless of whether there's air in the rifle or not, there will be some vibrations that occur and the severity of these vibrations will depend on how heavy the hammer is. So if for example we had to compare an FX Royale and an Air Arms S510, both shooting at exactly the same velocity, you'd probably find that the vibrations that come from the S510 are significantly more violent because the hammer on the S510 is very heavy. You'll know what I'm talking about if you've ever fired an FX rifle before. The lack of recoil compared to some other guns really takes you by surprise. Okay. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm going crazy. Don't worry, I'm not going to serenade you. I'm using this guitar to demonstrate a point here. Um, if I pluck the string on a guitar, what happens is it vibrates back and forth. We're going to pretend that this guitar string is the barrel of an air gun. Now when you pull the trigger and air is released, it sends a shock wave through the barrel and the barrel vibrates, just like the guitar string does. This means that at any given time, the muzzle of your gun could be deflected off its axis by a fraction of a millimeter and this can cause the pellet to be thrown completely off course. The degree to which the muzzle is deflected is dependent on two things. Number one, the amplitude of the wave, and number two, how close the nearest node is to the muzzle itself. Now if we turn our focus back to the guitar string here, we can see that the amplitude of the vibrations can actually be manipulated. I can do this by increasing the tension of the guitar string as I play it. This will decrease how much the string can actually vibrate off its uh, center point, if you can call it that. In the same way, I can decrease the amplitude of the vibrations in my gun by increasing the rigidity of the gun. There are a number of ways to do this. One way is to thicken the barrel of the gun. Uh, this will make the barrel more rigid and cause it to vibrate a little less. Another way is to add weight to the gun whether that's weight in the stock, in the breech, or in the scope. The heavier a gun is, the more inertia it will have. Um, inertia is basically an object's resistance to motion, and therefore we can say that a heavier gun will be less likely to shake around, right? At this point, you're probably thinking that I'm taking this way too far, but just to show you how much of an impact this can make, we're gonna do a bit of a test. So I've got the Air Arms S510 here, and I've got two different stocks for the gun. I've got the Ultimate Sporter stock, which is quite chunky and quite heavy. 
and then we've got the lighter walnut stock. They're about the same length. The bipod's gonna be fitted at pretty much exactly the same point along the rifle. The only thing that's gonna change is the stock. So the barrel's the same, the scope is the same, but I can bet you now that we're gonna see quite a severe point of impact shift when we change the scopes. So I'm gonna take three shots with the Ultimate Sporter stock on the S510, and then I'm gonna switch stocks, and we're gonna take another three shots on target. Got a camera down range, we'll be able to see whether there's a point of impact shift or not. There you go, we've got three shots pretty much straight through the bullseye at 25 meters. We're gonna simply switch the stocks out. It'll only take a minute. There you go. Walnut stock fitted. Take another three shots. There you go. So that is a half a mil deflection at 25 meters. That's quite a severe point of impact shift. And all I did was change the stocks. Went from a heavier stock to a lighter stock. Very interesting, isn't it? How's that for on target, eh? Pretty good. So we've discussed how increasing the rigidity of a rifle can decrease the amplitude of those vibration waves. The next thing to consider is that the weight distribution of a rifle can actually determine the location of those nodes and anti-nodes. Now this can be both a positive and a negative. It can be a problem because it means that these guns can have a degree of hold sensitivity. In other words, if you hold the gun tighter or looser than usual, you can find that your point of impact is inconsistent. This usually isn't such a problem with PCPs, but the vibrations that travel through a springer are so violent that if you don't hold that gun exactly the same every time you pull that trigger, you are just going to find that you can't get any kind of grouping at all. And that's just one of the reasons that I haven't bothered to even look at springers in the series. They just aren't suited to long range shooting. Now I want to take some time here quickly to answer a question that I'm very frequently asked and that is regarding silencers and a point of impact shift. Most people will fit a silencer to their gun and they'll get a quite a severe point of impact shift downrange and they'll assume that the pellet is clipping the, the baffles in their silencer. And while this may be the problem, a lot of the time it's got nothing to do with the pellet clipping at all. It's, it's all got to do with the way that the barrel moves up and down or left to right or whatever when you, when you fire the gun. So I'm gonna do another test here. I'm gonna fire two shots without any silencer on the end of my Daystate Wolverine. And then I'm going to fit this beautiful little uh, custom silencer that I have. It's small. Um, I'm gonna fit it to the end of the gun. We're gonna take another two shots and you'll see that there's, again, quite a severe point of impact shift. Okay, let's do this. It's gonna be loud. Do one more. Okay, I rushed that a bit, but let's put silence on the end now and see how this changes. Now, as I prepare to shoot the second group here, there is one thing that I want to mention. Now, you can see that I have decided to shoot with a bipod 
and a sandbag here. And there's a reason that I uh, like to shoot like this. Not only does it keep the rifle still, but it keeps the points of contact between the rifle and the bench exactly the same for every shot. Now, if you're really serious about your accuracy, and I'm talking like millimeters here, you'll want to consider shooting off a bipod because it will go a long way in completely eradicating the problem of hole sensitivity. That is about half a mil doc deflection once again. So again, quite a, quite a severe point of impact shift when we add just a little silence at the end. Now that's got nothing to do with the overall weight of the gun. That's got to do with harmonics. That's got to do with the way that the, the rifle vibrates when you take a shot. Now interestingly enough, I've noticed that every different kind of silencer that I fit to the end of the Wolverine, even a slight weight difference will result in a point of impact shift. But on my AOMS S510, I can change, well, I can add and remove silencers at will, and it hardly changes the point of impact at all, maybe a, just a millimeter. And that comes down to the fact that this barrel is a floating barrel. Um, in other words, there's no barrel band at the end here that's keeping it rigid. Whereas on the S510, there is a barrel band, and that barrel is, is not able to move at all. So again, it comes down to rigidity of the gun. It's very, very important. Now here's another very interesting question for you that might pick your brains a little bit. Why is it that you can have two very different guns shooting at exactly the same power using exactly the same barrels but one gun will just be more accurate than the other? I believe that this comes down to the fact that air guns can actually be harmonically tuned just like centerfire rifles can. In other words, these guns can actually be made um, in a way that the, the node is located right at the muzzle. In other words, no matter how violent the vibrations are throughout the gun, the end of the gun will remain still at all times. Whether this is on purpose or not, uh, I don't know. It could just be by chance that some guns are made like that, but I believe that this is a major uh, factor in, in a gun's accuracy. So I suppose this could be a challenge to some of the air gun manufacturers out there. If you're watching this, I challenge you to do some experimenting with whatever prototype you're working on. Try out just slight variations in, in barrel length and perhaps the thickness of the barrel as well. Experiment a bit to see if it makes a difference and don't just test your rifles in a vase. Test your rifles with the stock on, with a shooter, like you would after someone's bought the gun. Test your guns like that and see if it makes any difference. And that's the end of another one, guys. I hope you found this interesting. I know I did, uh, doing, doing all the research and stuff. Very interesting topic. And next week, we're going to be looking at another very interesting topic, barrels and twist rate. Yo, I might even have to split that one into to two separate um, videos because it's just such a meaty, chunky topic. There's so much to work through and um, I'm probably going to fry my own brain and fry your brain if I, if I try to talk too much on it. But anyway, look forward to seeing you next week. Shoot safe. Thanks for watching.